So welcome back, uh, everybody. What a fascinating conversation we've just had. Um, I know there was an awful lot of conversation going on in the, in the chat between the panelists, um, a lot of uh, differing views on, on some of the topics, and I'm sure that those will continue um, off screen. Um, we've spoken about citizen science now in terms of its place uh, potentially against official sources of data. Now we want to take a, a look and see how um, SafeCast could be used as a potential model for others looking to engage um, with members of the public or for members of the public to engage with science um, and scientific practice in, in other areas and potentially um, to look at other aspects. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ian to look at citizen science and SafeCast um, with uh, Yoka, Akiba and Marco. So uh, over to you, Ian, as the moderator. Thank you very much, Louise. So I will hopefully uh, talk for a little bit while everybody else uh, please adds the spotlights for the other panelists. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to have Marco Zanaro, Akiba uh, from Freak Labs and Yoki Kennens also from uh, SK Sen. Um, to discuss uh, citizen science and perspectives on SafeCast. And we're going to begin by, by going to Yorka. Uh, and I'll ask, rather than take up time so that we keep the flow going, perhaps uh, as I go to each person, you can maybe just give a brief friend to yourself rather than be doing it as a, as a whole. And we'll, there's kind of three questions we've got for this section. Yorka is going to take us back uh, to thinking about just actually what, what do we mean by citizen science? It, I think it's one of these terms that means a lot of things to different people. So we'll get our answer from Yoke, at least for this session, and then we can debate it at the end, as I'm sure it will always be debatable. Uh, and then we'll, uh, Marcos, uh, I'm really glad he's here. To You've seen the Safecast stories and the interaction with lots of young people. Uh, a lot of that came from uh, the benefit of interacting with ICTP in 2017. So Marco will tell us a lot about his experiences uh, internationally, uh, going beyond, you know, the community in Europe and the community in Japan, uh, to much wider field uh, for the reach that ICTP and, and the IEA has in, in interacting with scientists from developing countries. And then to come back, you know, I, I'm a physicist, I like my gadgets and my gizmos and uh, Freak Labs, the keeper, uh, will tell us why, you know, why we're able to do this and and maybe give us some, some tantalising tastes of the, of the cool bits of kit to come. So it's uh, uh, and then we'll discuss it as we go in at the end. But uh, uh, now I, I'm going to shut up and hand over to Yoke to, to really get, you know, get, give us a definition of citizen science. Thank you, Ian. Um, so my name is Yoke Kienans. I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Leuven and SEK. And for the past four years, I've been uh, researching citizen science after Fukushima. I've also interviewed um, SafeCast members to contribute to my research. Um, and it might be during my um, talk that there are some special effects as there is some thunder and heavy rain here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but I've been asked to um, go deeper into the question of what is citizen science, try to come up with a sort of def uh, definition and also um, discuss how it has uh, changed over the past decade. And I can say that um, giving a definition of citizen science has become increasingly difficult. Um, it's, it has actually become one of a, yeah, it has become a topic within citizen science research itself. I've also uh, researched um, about this in Japan. Um, and instead of coming up with a definition, uh, that would be a, too big of a challenge. I decided to give you four keywords, um, which I think summarize or at least give, a, a, give an idea of citizen science. So my four keywords are um, umbrella term, citizen engagement, involvement or participation and science. And I will go into each of these keywords um, deeper as I go along. Um, so my first keyword was um, umbrella term. Um, over the past decade, there have been many typologies of citizen science indicating that citizen science is not one type of science or there is not one citizen science, but there are actually many types of citizen science. And um, also in the past five years, I would say that there, is, there has been increased attention given to the fact that citizen science also differs amongst countries within regions. Um, if I'm talking about burgerwetenschap in Dutch, it might mean something different than um, in Japanese, for example. Um, so there are these cultural and societal differences, which makes citizen science even more complex. 
And then there is also the question of um, who actually initiated uh, a citizen science project. For example, in Safecast's uh, case, it's citizens who really took, um, yeah, who developed um, devices on their own, who went out on the field, measured, um, also um, did uh, put these measurements online. But then there are also other uh, citizen science projects who are initiated by uh, research institutions. So instead of one citizen science, there are many kinds. Moving on to who is the citizen that we are talking about when, um, yeah, uh, within citizen science. Um, when I was doing research in Japan and I asked um, SafeCast members, are you citizen scientists? They would say yes. But in other cases, in, um, in other organizations in Fukushima, I also sometimes got the answer, no. I'm not a citizen scientist because I'm not a professional scientist. Um, I don't have a degree in physics in, um, in, in science or whatsoever, so I cannot be a citizen scientist. And then, so this, this already indicates that citizen is sometimes debatable. And then if we look at who gets actually involved as volunteers in citizen science projects these days, um, there is also a mix, but not all layers of society are always um, addressed. And this is a challenge that um, citizen science will have to address in the upcoming years, I think. And then in terms of engaging involvement and participation of science, there are many types of different uh, citizen science projects, as I've mentioned before. And um, sometimes this means that citizens are involved only in um, data collection, but are sometimes involved uh, setting up a research project, uh, gathering the data, also um, interpreting the data. So there is a um, yeah, there are various um, citizen science projects, and not one type of citizen science is not better than the others. It's exactly this mix of uh, projects that makes citizen science very interesting. And then um, question of science. Um, I think in the previous roundtable, this has been discussed uh, quite intensely already and um, also showcases that this is a, a topic of discussion or at least a discussion that could last for hours. Um, but I think uh, SafeCast has in the past decades um, challenged this notion of what is science? What do we understand as science? And how should and uh, can um, citizens become involved in uh, scientific research? All this to say that I've given you four keywords um, and I really wanted to answer just one question. What is citizen science? But probably I've raised more questions than I, than I have answered. But this is also exactly the point I wanted to make. Um, in the past decade, citizen science has, um, has enabled us to ask all these questions, to discuss. And this is also what um, is yeah, valuable of, uh, about citizen science and also what keeps citizen science going and thriving. Thank you. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. So thank you very much, Yoke. Uh, and that's going to take us nicely into the discussion with Marco. But I was just, I, I mean, before we before we dive into Marco's section, we get started. We, you know, we're on the clock. We've got time. I was really intrigued there with the notion of uh, I can't be it because I'm a I'm not a scientist. And you know, I I always you know I, I kind of think back to you know the the 19th century stuff. What does it mean? It's you know the science is a shorthand for scientific method. I mean, it's but now it's worn as a kind of cloak, and you know we get. You're in the realms of uh, CP snows and two cultures and things like this, and this is something that, I mean, today's event we've had, we've got all sorts of music and different things coming together. I think this is, you know, if you if you wanted to answer that kind of two cultures question, you know, bridging the gap, actually, community like Safecast is is something that says, well, that that's a, a, a fallacy. It's not true. People are both, and and depending on what they're doing, and I am uh, I am not a as, as colleagues of mine would say. I'm not a chemist. I'm really not a chemist. So, but I, I'm a scientist because I'm a physicist. But I'm not a scientist because I'm not a chemist. I, I, I wonder, you know, what heart or what lens, and, and how people self-reflect and choose whether they're engaged or not. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think, um, yeah. In, in in case of Japan, it also has to do how science is perceived uh, in Japanese culture. I got a sense that science is something that is, um, yeah, of value. 
um, that is considered for, yeah, as, as rights, something um, esteemed. And especially um, considering that many members that I've interviewed um, have, yeah, they have no background, but they um, are, for example, mothers um, who became involved in, um, in measuring radiation after Fukushima. Um, there is this um, image of what science should be and what they are doing, and that doesn't match up always. I think that's more or less the issue. So to to keep to keep us going, and it's especially as you as you brought it back to the conversation of thinking about what is in Japan. Uh, this seems like a perfect segue to talk to Marco and say, Marco, you know, you out of all of us, you're the ones that probably has the most contact with the most young people developing sciences scientists of anyone in the panel. Uh, I, I mean, I I worked with you for a good few years, but you've been to more places and met more young people than I have. So, uh, I'd be you know, why don't you tell us a bit about that school? But then maybe also you know all these people that you're meeting through ICTP, I mean, presumably they all think of themselves as scientists. Uh, I, I know we have conversations during the schools. Maybe you can share some of that with the audience. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, that looks like, you know, a previous life, right? <laughs> now, meeting people from all over the world, you know, physically now, it's, it's mostly virtual. So I, I do have some slides that I want to share, should be on now. So I would like to tell you a bit about this workshop that has been uh, mentioned today in a in, in few occasions. Um, it was organized by the ICTP and the Atomic Agency in 2017. So let me just tell you one slide why ICTP uh, is you know, interested in citizen science and what is the ICTP. ICTP stands for International Center for Theoretical Physics. It is a research organization funded more than 50 years ago by a Nobel laureate called Abdul Salam, coming from Pakistan. We're a category one in, uh, UNESCO institution, which means that we're a UN organization, and we work closely with the Atomic Agency. And the idea of the ICTP is to create a hub where people can meet people from all over the world. So this is not a center for developing countries. It's a center where people from developing countries and from industrialized countries can meet and carry out research together. Why are we interested in citizen science? So we have theoretical physics in our name, but the mission is to uh, support and to foster science in developing countries. And we do that in the framework of what is called open science. So Yoke just mentioned this umbrella concept. And if you look at the umbrella concept of open science, you see that one of the components, in fact, is citizen science. And the reason why we're interested in that at the CTP is first of all, the lack of scientific measurements. We just heard that in, in the previous session from, from Ralph, mentioning that very often citizen science is the only option for many of the scientists. Second reason is that we're talking about big data, machine learning and so on, but they all need data. So if you don't have data in the first place, there's very little you can do. Third point is that you know, scientists are citizens. So it's, you know, we might ask if you know, citizens are scientists, but without any doubt, scientists are citizens. So, and finally, the, the last point is outreach. So we want to outreach, uh, you know, in the whole society. So working on citizen science is very interesting for, you know, that point of view as well. Getting back to the activity, it has, you know, an acronym, SMR 2858. SMR stands for seminar. It was three weeks long in March, 2017. We had 28 particip participants from 25 different countries. So, uh, you know, alphabetically from Armenia to Zambia. So we have from A to Z. And there are some statistics here. You see that uh, most of the participants um, do come from, from developing countries. There is an e a even distribution. A third come from Africa, a third from Asia, and a third from Latin America and, and Europe. There are young people that, again, was, uh, you know, mentioned today many times and 70% were junior, so meaning less than 30 years old. Gender is, you know, a kind of usual distribution of activities in, in the scientific world. So about 30% of participants were, were female. What was special about this activity, it was a hands-on activity. So again, we have theoretical physics in our name, but we really like this uh, philosophy. So with Ian, we 
agreed on 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 working in, in you know along this line say tell me and I forget teach me and I might remember but involve me and I learn that is a call from Benjamin Franklin and we really believe that that's that's important so as one picture can mean more than a thousand worlds I I, I I added some some pictures here so the workshop was three weeks long so the first week was devoted to building the big Aigi. that was uh, with the help and support of Asby and, and Joe. Second week was about data. So what to do with the data that we collect with the Big IG. And third week was about dissemination or uh, about uh, you know, letting people know uh, what they can do with the data that we, that we collect. So this was the environment. So again, first week was you know, some lectures and then a lot of, of hard. And People started by soldering, and that was, in many cases, their first time they ever soldered something. So in one week, you go from soldering, uh, you know, learning about soldering to soldering a device that should be working properly. So that's, you know, a big, a big achievement. You've seen the first picture, people look, you know, worried maybe and concentrated. And so they learn how to solder properly. We, of course, had four of Asby and, and Joe in teaching them. And, you know, as they started working together, this is also quite interesting in, in these sort of activities, you have this, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning. So not just from the lecturers or from the, uh, you know, tutors, but from the peers uh, as well. So people that know how to solve or teach to other people. And finally, the you know, happy faces, people that start uh, you know, getting a uh, uh, working and, you know, sharing their experience. So each participant would have one device, which would, they would then take. And finally, at the end of the first week, they had a working device, which of course we tested, it worked properly. And so you see many, many happy faces. And of course, this wasn't, you know, soldering something they wouldn't understand. So it was not just, you know, repeating something that they would learn, but it was actually learning how the device. And again, you see very, very happy. Interesting aspect is that as the course was three weeks, they had the chance to travel from Trieste, which is in the northeastern part of Italy, to other places. So during the first weekend, they brought the device with their uh, you know, peers. So this was people moving in, in for people going to Venice. Boom. To uh, you know, many European cities carry the devices with them, so they would carry out some measurements while traveling, ready for the second week where they would learn how to make sense of this of this data. And in fact, this is is the second week where you know Asby was uh, connecting to uh, to set the, the the results. There's Joe, uh, you know, helping participants in in uh, finding. And this is again Joe in, in Venice, I believe, carrying out some measurements. This was extremely empowering because, again, in three weeks, you get from you know, learning how to solder to building a device to carrying out some measurements and to measurements. People in, people in nearby Slovenia, people in, in Venice walking with their, with their. And this is the second week. So you would see the, the trace. Uh, from the GPS with the measurement. This, I think, is, is from Venice and, you know, discussing with their peers, uh, you know, what this data would, would mean. So second and third week, again, we had presentations, uh, study presentations, and then we had this very strong social networking aspect, which I think was really special about this event. I think it was unique and, it lasted very long. So this was the new year in the Iranian uh, calendar. So we celebrated that as well. And then the third week was again about uh, uh, presenting the data and talking to the public. So they would learn how, you know, how to discuss with public, how to make uh, you know, decisions on what to say that you collected. Again, very strong people having fun. And third week was a discussions and you know, happy participants. 
aspect is that we set up a Telegram group and this has been running for four years now. This is a post from the, uh, last year where a participant from Dominican Republic shared his data uh, measure with the big guy game that was given to him uh, during the workshop. So it lasted you know, more than three years. So this really created a very strong community. That's all from my side for this first round. Thanks. Uh, so just uh, very, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a place. So I, just, I mean, I'm going to steal, we're, we're, we're a bit tight, but uh, just to come back, for those of you that were on earlier, the theme song for the event is called Make Me Smile. Uh, I have to confess, there's a few messages watching you put those pictures up. Uh, you know, uh, Peter was telling me off last night, you say, yeah, you're, you're a grumpy stocks when you never smile. Well, you know, that was a great event. Just just seeing those pictures coming back. And there was one thing that you, you, that you, you, you mentioned about the soldering, I think it's worth just bringing out. It's this business of getting buy-in. Um, the fact that the people uh, were had the opportunity to build their own device, they had a sense of ownership about the device, participation in it, and it translates, uh, not not that much data, but uploading the measurements, obviously, it, it, it tailed off later. And for me, I, I was as I was thinking about it as you were talking there, Marco, I mean, the, the very first let's say, distributed science that I ever knew of was the kind of, you know, the SETI search where you could download a little program on your computer and it would analyse a bit of data. And it was kind of fun, but you got bored with it. I, well, at least I got bored with it fairly quickly because it was just, you know, yes, you can use my computer, but I don't really do anything for it. But in this project, it's completely different. And I remember that, that sense over the three weeks where there was a, a very strong involvement in the activity. I wonder if you... If you if you, you want to just add a remark about you know this this the importance of this of getting the buy in and then having the much longer lasting effect, I'll just say that all the videos you're seeing today are because I sent a message on the Telegram, um, and so that's how strong that community is even after all this thing. So so Marco, absolutely yes yes that's really important. So in 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 many of these countries, getting a you know scientific device or scientific instrument. It's something that is, you know, valued as super expensive and something you would never own. In fact, it does happen sometimes that in, in developing countries, devices are not used because people fear about, you know, breaking them. So what will happen if I break this device? I will have to, you know, pay for it. I don't really own it. It's owned by some organization in the north or in some rich country. So building the device from scratch, learning how to solder, putting it together, using it, you know, validating the data has been extremely empowering. I think it's it's really unique. And that segues us brilliantly on to the next phase of discussing hardware. So Akiva, uh, could, could maybe I can hand over to you and you can you can tell us about uh, the, the the evolution of of uh, electronics and you know devices that are that are making you know a nice bright rosy future. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I'm so. I'm actually going to, I have some slides. I'd like to share my screen really quickly. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Akiba from Freak Labs. Uh, I was one of the original designers of the SafeCast hardware in 2011, specifically the geotagging radiation sensors, AKA BGAIGI, as well as the fixed radiation sensor network, AKA NGAIGI. So today I'm here to talk about citizen science and what can happen in the next 10 years, especially in the context of technology. Uh, so if I look to the future of citizen science, I would say the toolkit is much broader than what we had available in 2011 when SafeCast started. This will have a profound impact in the types of projects people will undertake with more sophisticated projects undertaken as uh, civilian projects. I mean, um, it's just, you can't really even kind of contrasted, I think. So, and we'll get into that in a second. I think um, there are a lot of things impacting the future of citizen science, but some that are having the most profound impact right now are the proliferation of low cost technology. The cost of computing hardware is dropping like a rock. So most notably, it's a, you can see it by the Raspberry Pi Pico, which was uh, recently announced. It's a dual core 32 bit processor board and costs $4 four US dollars. So these have more computing power than a VAX workstation, which cost nearly a million dollars in 1990. 
and that's approximately when I graduated from high school. So it's really just amazing right now. Um, also, there are really impressive things happening in the communications world too. The wireless sensor network world seems to be standardizing on LoRa, which stands for long range, as the protocol of choice. LoRa is quite amazing in the distances it can achieve and the fact that when not in use, it's extremely low power. So for me, um, deploying wildlife, like so I work in wildlife and environmental uh, monitoring and deploying wildlife environmental technology in remote places in the world, being able to have a battery life of six months to a year is huge. There's also a big change from when we ran SafeCast in 2011, um, and that's the availability of cellular and satellite communications. Um, like at the time it was also available, but it was much more difficult to use. So you had to have a special deal with the phone companies, like for cellular communications, you had to have a special uh, deal with the phone companies to get multiple SIM cards. And you had to have like, if you didn't have that deal, then you'd have to have like a special, some kind of, you have to buy a package plan for every uh, SIM card that you wanted. So today, most phone providers have IOT plans where you can get SIMs and cellular connectivity for around $2 a month, which is amazing. Um, satellite connectivity has also become more available, much cheaper and smaller. And so it's like they've gotten so small that uh, in bird tracking, people are attaching satellite uh, communications devices to birds to uh, track their migration. And there's also a lot of advanced technology available such as LIDAR, drones, uh, thermal imagers, particle counters, gas sensors, and spectral photometers. And that's just naming a few. I won't even get into cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and satellite imaging. Like that's, you know, that is exploding right now too. With these types of tools, it's really, it's really possible to create technology that couldn't have been imagined even just a few decades ago. So I think right now we are really living in the future. And I think within the next 10 years, these will just get more and more developed and also uh, ubiquitous. Um, what does this mean for citizen science? So although the cost of technology has decreased, it's still not a utopian situation. And we're seeing some cracks forming already. Um, one of the biggest issues are between the haves and have nots. So the digital divide is widening. Many of the platforms and devices are only accessible to engineers or technically advanced people. So I work in wildlife and environmental monitoring with extremely smart scientists but they don't have a background in technology, so they don't know what their options are and what options are available. And conversely, engineers know what options are available, but don't know what the big problems that need solving are. And we need to figure out how to bridge those gaps. Um, there's also a proliferation of computing platforms that if you're not in the tech industry are dizzying. When SafeCast started, most people just used the Arduino platform. The new kid on the block at that time was Raspberry Pi. Now there's kind of decision overload. So people have limited time and they don't know which platform to choose. And right now, like choosing a platform is like laying down chips at a roulette table. Like where would they invest their time? So in the projects that uh, we do, like as Freak Labs and the courses we teach, we standardize on the following three platforms, which is Python for application software, Arduino for embedded computing and device hardware and uh, LoRa for wireless communications. And actually, so like, uh, and w I'm, also, I'm also personally watching Marco very closely because Marco, who's also on this panel, uh, like standardize, standardizes on Python uh, and also MicroPython on embedded devices, which is uh, really interesting and LoRa for wireless. And so that's, so the MicroPython is actually really exciting too but uh, we're still kind of uh, wait, waiting and seeing on that. Um, so actually there's many other things to look forward to and also to watch out for, but I think we can save that for another talk. So in the meantime, thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, I will stop sharing now and- Thank you very much Akiva, that was, that's, uh -huh. that's 
really interesting and a good uh, and, a, and a very wide ranging summary. Um, so I, in fact, you, you you threw me off there at the end, so so because I had a question in my mind and I kind of get I kind of lost it a little bit. But uh, yes, so there we go. Right, it's back. Uh, Swiss cheese for brain when it catches up. <laughs> the, the way that these the, these the sessions are going today, I, I'm kind of intrigued. There, we'll come back to hardware, and if you you know if you caught the end of the first talk, it was you know it's what Dan's final point was kind of like. Well, you know, actually maybe the future looks like the methodology and the engagement and and less like the hardware, but the hardware is really critical, and we're and we're you know we've come back to that point here. We've discussed the buy-in, but in the previous session we've been debating you know. How, will will official them use it? How does this get adopted? I think the end of it at this point, you know, in the day, not just this session. It's it's, it's a nice place to kind of have a look at it and going. Well, what's the experience of Safecast after the ten years on all of these things? There, we're now at a point we've got to choose a future. So there's brilliant new hardware available, but some of the problems that were in 2011 are still problems. But the problems of people, and I think you were uh, alluding to that actually the people issue is getting worse because there is separation of uh, the people with problems and people who are interested in solving the problem. So uh, I, I, I kind of, I'll throw, go back to you, Akiba, first, but then I think we just about an open conversation for the remaining uh, nine minutes before Louise comes in. So uh, please, Akiba, if you'd like to start. Um, I guess, like, so I think there are a couple of questions in there, but I think, I, I think you hit on a really important one, which is that people are probably the most critical in this. Like, I think, um, like, you have engineers and technically savvy people, but they need, like, they need to, or I guess we need to work with domain specialists, and there needs to be that co cooperation or to bridge that uh, divide. Otherwise, like the people that I, the scientists I work with in environmental uh, monitoring, then they're like just complete experts of the field, but they don't know what options are ava available. And so, um, whereas I think there's a lot of new options that are recently uh, possible, like especially like sat like satellite communications, right? So in very remote areas that like, it's like, oh, sure, we can do that. And then I think they're just like stunned. And then, but if it were up to me, then I'd be measuring the wrong things. Whereas they're like, oh, that's a solved problem. We know. We know that's possible. This is what we're really interested in, and that's that's really important. Marco, are you okay? You want to jump in, or, or or a more pointed question, or have you got something to add? Yeah, sure. So just to point out that so now we have the engineers, we have the domain experts, and from the you know previous session, we need to have the policy experts as well, right? And when we're talking about, you know, wireless equipment, like you know, satellite devices, I mean, they're available on the market, but it might be really hard to get them in some specific countries. So you have that aspect of policy as well. And then, and then we have the citizens, right? Well, you know, Joker uh, raised. So how, how do they play in this? So it's, it's I think, quite challenging and, 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 and quite interesting. Um, you look like I, you want to say something, you okay? I'm not sure, yes? Yes, um, yeah, I wanted to say that um, I just feel that this technical device might also play a role, for example, for citizens who have no um, background in, um, yeah, and for example, computer science or, yeah, more natural sciences, um, which may also play a role uh, in, yeah, which may also increase the divide or yeah, so there is also um, maybe a need to um, have some kind of equipment or sensors that can be readily, readily um, can be used um, by, by citizens who have no uh, background knowledge in or have no knowledge on how these sensors actually work, but can operate them. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, I think like uh, user interface design is actually really important because um, like ultimately, like like the engineer is there just to kind of kind of materialize the concept, but ultimately the engineer is probably not going to be the one that operates the devices. And 
so to, to, to just ask a specific question, I, so I, I think the three of you probably have a, a good feel for other projects that are going out there. I know air, so Safecast is involved in, in air quality, but air quality has become a really important thing to many people. Uh, are there other groups in, coming out in the world that are looking to Safecast and you know, do you have a, have a sense of what they what what they're taking away from Safecast in terms of a mo, as a model of being a citizen science organisation? You know, a transparent. You know, Safecast. Take a specific example. Safecast has been very keen on the CC zero transparency of data. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this is a debate for some people. I I'd be interested to know if you if what your thoughts are about are, are other people looking at what Safecast has done this last 10 years and thinking, yes, that, that's the right model, we should do things like that. Or do they see flaws in what Safecast have done and, and should Safecast be paying attention to uh, what other people uh, who, you know, the new kids in the block, you know, if you're, you get old and you stand still and you get kicked out of the way from behind. That's well, the I, if I might, yeah, if I might comment on that. So I, I, I work at ICTP, so I work for UNESCO. And this concept of open science, I think is quite interesting because it is an umbrella concept that has so many components. Uh, you know, there's open access of you know, publications and of data. There's open data, there's citizen sciences, open hardware, there's open source. And so if I think about a project that you know, can tick all these components, I think that's Safecast. Very often projects, you know, focus on one specific field, you know, the, or, you know, making data open, but then the hardware is not open. Or, uh, you know, the hardware is open, but then, you know, the data is not that easy to download. And I think, again, Safecast, if you consider all these open science components, I think it has, you know, all of them, of course, including citizen science. So I think it's a great example of open science. I do think I do think that um, I I'm not really sure if there's like kind of a new kid on the block that's you know that's going to take over or whatever. But I do think that like things are constantly changing. New tools are available, and um, I think it's important uh, for any any organization involved in any kind of you know activity, and especially like kind of like. Um, like environmental monitoring, radiation monitoring, and scientific activity is really just like there's this constant evolution. So, and I think there's always this, you know, like I think open open data and open source is is great, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't mean anything to the people if they don't know how to use that. Like, I can ha I can put out all my hardware schematics and all my software files, but if they don't understand what it means that it doesn't, then there's no purpose. And so I think that, you know, and so, you know, perhaps the next generation, the next iteration of organizations might be fo more focused on teaching lay people how to use the data to create something that's custom, custom for them. So anyways. I actually would add on, would like to add on uh, Akiva and also Marco. Um, because I think what Safecast has also demonstrated is how to create an international community um, and how to engage various uh, citizens, but also institutions um, into citizen science. And I think that is also a lesson for, for Safecast futures, uh, future projects, but also for other citizen science projects. So, um to, you know, I like to stray into, into other places, but Marco, you know, one of the things we were very concerned about, um, and this was kind of, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, Ralph Kaiser brought this up, you know, in terms of this free, free societies and democracies, but there are also other places where uh, we, you know, we've interacted with people and they're very grateful for the device and it's very useful, but they're very careful of, you know, they're not going to be able to submit or use this. So Safecast really is very international. It's, it's brilliant. It's very Northern Hemisphere, uh, and it's got a, a particular subset of a community. What is missing from the um, the uh, uh, what, what? Not missing. Let's uh, let's not sit catching for you. But what could uh, an organisation like Safecast, focused on the the citizen science side of it, do to broaden out actually beyond the kind of 
very well established democracies, but I think if you look at the map of Safecast data, you can kind of see in you by one lens, you could almost interpret it as a map of political freedom. So for, uh, where's the role uh, of the citizen science in supporting people uh, where there's dark spots in that map? Hmm, that's a very interesting point. I think there comes the role of outreach and of dissemination. So well, we're now tackling you know the community of scientists, which is you know excellent, of course, and excellent that I mean a community that had no access to data in their own environment. And again, there is a number of examples, right? If you look at earthquakes, it's exactly the same. In many of these countries, you do get sensors coming from you know industrialized countries for you know a couple of years and then they go they're you know sent back to you know rich countries so local scientists they don't own the devices so that's you know great about safecast on the other hand i think there's kind of an awareness uh, you know need so you need to create an awareness about the utility i mean the usefulness of this of this data so in and that's a different community that's a community of you know decision makers and if you want of you know political level in some way so we try to do that at ictp in some of the events so creating like a short kind of awareness workshop about you know the needs and then you know getting to the kind of more technical and, and and scientific level but i think that that awareness level is very useful i i would also say like um because like uh, i i don't I think instead of saying democratic, I'd say like there there are political implications to data, because in the early days of Safecast, then um, the government actually forbade anybody to publish data, and like anybody that would publish data would you know had were threatened with kind of being arrested, um, and at that time actually Safecast like uh, Safecast had lost a lot of its sponsorships because of that because organizations didn't want to be associated with um, with uh, kind of somebody like an, an organization that's kind of defying the government. Um, so I do think that there are like kind of political ramifications with uh, data collection and publication. And I think that, um, so I, I don't like truthfully though, I don't know what the right answer is because I don't know if you want to endanger your life in order to publish the data, but maybe in some cases it's important, so. Yeah. You know. Like we we were kind of we were a little bit pissed off, so we just kind of put the data out there, and then, and luckily nothing happened. So. <laughs> you okay? You look like you have something to add. Um. Yeah. I, I maybe I wanted to add um that it's yeah I think Akiva's story and also um, uh yeah that the fact that um Safecast is mostly um, you know, volunteers, uh, volunteers for Safecast mostly come from the northern part of the world. Also has to do with um, paying attention to the local context and trying to see um, where or how Safecast can uh, contribute. And that may, yeah, differ from context to context. Um, but yeah, it's finding those gaps, I, I think, as well as adapting to that context. I'm going to try and sneak in one one last question uh, based on you know what's what's transpired in the last year you know in terms of um, social media and you know I, I just like the term fake news but Marco during our school we were we were talking about how to how to equip people to, to question it my my question is if it, when people when they, when it's quite obvious that sometimes people are willing to just put blinkers on and they're in a tribe and they're going to stick with that point of view. Can you give it a re, you know we've got only a minute left? Do you what's your opinion on a, a positive, happy outlook for the future of a growing international citizen science community? I would again again point out to this open science umbrella concept. So I I, I think that would end you know social media and awareness and uh, outreach is included there. There is even, you know, uh, indigenous knowledge, so knowledge from the community itself. So I think if you stick with, you know, all these different components, 
I think that's a good uh, way to be successful. I hope that answered your question, Ian. I'm looking for optimism, so yes. Akiba, and then the last word to Joachim. Um, I think, because I heard there were, in the previous conversations, there's a lot of discussion about the professionals need to uh, do the science. But truthfully, I think because we're looking at climate change, um, a lot of uh, environmental like kind of catastrophes and things like that, that I do think that actually it's not just the scientists uh, that can do this. So I think everybody can play a role and, you know, it's becoming cheaper. You can get all your instruction on YouTube. And I think that truthfully, it's going to be important to have a lot of participation by non-scientists to augment the sci scientists' effort as well. Thank you for using the word climate change. I can't believe we've gone the whole day without having to say that. <laughs> Just ridiculous. You okay, last word to you before we, we cut to the video. Yes. Um, so I think um, as radiation, but also air pollution, those are topics that really touch upon people's lives and people's health. So there's also the question of the, the right to contribute, the right to um, provide data or to measure. Um, and I think this needs to be discussed further within the scientific community, but also um, with citizens and authorities involved. Maybe there is also um, a role left for, uh, for example, the European Association of Citizen Science or um, the Citizen Science Asia group. So I think there are many, yeah, the, there's still many discussions left, I think, but it's also exciting to see how citizen science will further develop. I, as everyone could tell, I could keep talking about this, but unfortunately, well, we've got more interesting things in the programme. So can I thank uh, Akiba, Marco and Yoke very much and uh, we'll move on to the next item. So Mary, uh, cue the video, please. <laughs>